Good afternoon, honored guests and friends here in the Orientale and uh, on, online from various parts of the world. Welcome to the Pontifical Oriental Institute. I welcome you all. This is not uh, a private institution. It belongs to everyone, everyone concerned with questions of, of the East and even how they uh, affect uh, the West. The conference today is, is one about which it's hard for me not to say something, but I fear that if I begin to say something, I will speak for a very long time. So I want to try and restrict myself simply to, to two points. For me, it's an excellent example of uh, the central point of the theology of Johann Metz, who says that theology, Christianity, must, must be concerned with the memory of unresolved suffering. Because the things that are unresolved continue to create problems as we move into the future. And we can see so many examples today, whether it's the situation in Israel with Palestinians, Palestinians and Israelis, whether Ethiopia, whether the, the former Soviet Union. There's so many things that remain, that remain unsolved, unresolved that continue to cause problems. And the only resolution is to enter into them, and as Jesus himself tells us, to find the truth because the truth will set you free. And finding the truth is difficult because of the ideologies, the emotions, the histories, the losses, the struggles, the victories that we have experienced in different ways, different people from different points of view. We have to get together and we have to talk. In other words, that's what is excellent about this presentation. It's aiming at the truth. It's aiming at the truth that will unite us. It's aiming at the truth that will set us free it's a process, it's not a conclusion. So we pray God's grace on this moment, this uh, moment of conversation from different points of view and different parties today, that we may approach that to which Jesus invites us. Welcome and good labor for everyone. Thank you, Father David. So it's also my pleasure to uh, welcome you to this presentation of the Lviv Sobor 1946 and its aftermath towards truth and reconciliation, a book that investigates the background, history, and fallout of a gathering of clergy that attempted to liquidate the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church. For three days in March 1946, priests and laity of the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church were assembled in the western Ukrainian city of Lviv and voted to join the Russian Orthodox Church. Today, some people praise it as a church council or sobor that undid uniatism and the decisions of the Union of Brest in 1596, while others call it a completely illegitimate pseudo sobor. As we will hear from our speakers, the Catholic Church has had a consistently clear line on the events of 1946. This was not and could not be a council of the Catholic Church since no Catholic bishops were present at this assembly and the participants were coerced by Soviet secret police and state authorities. The Greco-Catholic hierarchy in Soviet-controlled Western Ukraine had been arrested in 1945 by Soviet authorities and sentenced to hard labor in Siberian prison camps. Thus, in the absence of any Greco-Catholic hierarchy, a legitimate church council could not be convened. While the Catholic Church considered this assembly and its actions unlawful, the Orthodox Church has yet to speak out on this matter unanimously. Individuals have vocally condemned it, but the Russian Orthodox Church still considers it a legitimate council, restating its position frequently during major anniversaries. Some Russian Orthodox statements go so far as to call it a, quote, holy act of reuniting the Uniates to the Mother Church, end quote, regardless of the fact that the Greco-Catholic Church never considered the Moscow Patriarchate to be its Mother Church, nor desired to abandon union with Rome. Metropolitan Ilarion Olfeyev wrote in his widely circulated handbook on Orthodox Church history that, quote, in 1946, the Russian Orthodox Church expanded after the reunification of Ukrainian Greek Catholics with the Orthodox Church, and as a result, more than 3,000 Uniate churches became Orthodox, annulling the, in his words, tragic union of Brest in 1596. He admits that the liquidation of the Greek Catholic Church took place with the active support of state authorities, which revoked the registration of Greek Catholic parishes that refused to join the Russian Orthodox Church and subjected the Uniate clergy to fierce persecution. 
Nevertheless, in his words, the Russian Orthodox Church was not responsible for these repressions since it itself had just begun to rise from the ashes. On the other hand, Metropolitan Kalistos Ware of blessed memory acknowledged that the persecuted had become collaborators with the persecutor. Thus, he saw the events of 1946 as a tragedy. In his view, and I quote, the fate of the Greek Catholics after the Second World War was perhaps the darkest chapter in the story of the Moscow Patriarchate's collusion with communism, end of quotation. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, Metropolitan Kalistos lamented that if only the Moscow Patriarchate had taken the initiative in proposing a peaceful and negotiated solution, it would have won immense moral authority and much subsequent bitterness could have been avoided. Regrettably, there was no such initiative. And despite invitations to dialogue by various heads of the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church over the last few years, no response came from the Moscow Patriarchate. Metropolitan Kadyslus rightly regretted the lost moment of opportunity for mutual forgiveness and dialogue. Nevertheless, the duty of church historians and theologians is to investigate the facts of history to understand the truth. And anniversaries of these events demand that we reflect upon the past and look for paths forward toward reconciliation, healing the wounds of the body of Christ on the path to true unity from God, for which we pray many times in every divine liturgy. In 2016, a few months after Pope Francis met Patriarch Kirill in Havana, the Pro Oriente Foundation and the University of Vienna organized a conference gathering scholars and representatives from both the Russian Orthodox and Ukrainian Greco-Catholic churches to discuss a possible common narrative to the events of 1946. Despite an appeal for dialogue in the Havana Declaration, official Russian Orthodox representatives declined the invitation to attend the conference, making it impossible to seek a common narrative. Instead, the scholars who did attend discussed the background and prehistory of the Pseudo-Sobor, Orthodox and Catholic perspectives of the events of 1946, as well as the reception within the Soviet Union among Orthodox and Greco-Catholics in the diaspora, and the views of the Holy See, with concluding reflections looking for ways forward toward truth and reconciliation. With the publication of the conference volume only a few weeks ago, it was agreed that rather than shying away from this topic now, the occasion of the week of prayer for Christian unity with its theme of doing good and seeking justice, Isaiah 1, 17 to 18, could serve as an opportunity to reflect upon the difficult issue of Christian reconciliation in the face of injustice. The volume you see before you, yeah, there's a copy outside as well, contains the papers of the Vienna Conference and contributions from Frank Sisson of the University of Toronto on the background history to 1946, from Father Cyril Hovorun on Soviet political religion, Professor Sergei Firsov of the St. Petersburg Theological Academy on the reception of 1946 in the Moscow Patriarchate Press, Dr. Maria Horyacha of Ukrainian Catholic University on the history of the Lviv Sobor from a Catholic perspective, Professor Thomas Nemet and Bishop Theodor Martinuk on the canonicity of the gathering, Professor Natalia Schlichta of the Kiev Mohila Academy on the experience after 1946 within the Soviet Union, Father Yacinthe Destivel, also present here, on the Holy See's reaction, Reverend Professor Miroslav Tatarin of Waterloo University on emigre Ukrainian Greco-Catholic responses, and a vision for a way forward from both Catholic and Orthodox perspectives, presented by Professor Yuri Avakumov joining us online, and Professor Antoine Arzhakovsky of Collège des Bernardins in Paris. By the way, if, if you don't have 100 euros to spare, you can legally download a PDF of the whole volume for free from the library of the Pontifical Oriental Institute uh, through the catalog, or buy the book with a discount code as seen on the screen. The papers of this volume were presented ar already many years ago and written before the Thomas of Autocephaly granted to the Church of Ukraine by Patriarch Bartholomew in 2019 and the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022. Thus, there are new contexts to reflect upon when discussing the reconciliation of the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church and the Orthodox churches, especially in Ukraine. So, 
At this point, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome here today four of the contributors to the volume to speak to us. We will keep questions and discussion to the end after all four speakers have presented. And uh, at that point, I'll ask you to come forward to the microphone here. Uh, the first speaker is Archimandrite Cyril Hovorun, who is currently Professor of Ecclesiology, International Relations, and Ecumenism at the University College of Scot uh, Stockholm. And also, professor, yes, also this semester, uh, invited professor uh, teaching at the Gregoriana here in Rome. So welcome, Father Cyril. Thank you. Well, thank you, <clears throat> Father Daniel, for inviting uh, us to this, uh, uh, to this meeting. Thank you also for um, uh, your work to, to edit this volume, <clears throat> to put it together and to, to push it through the process of uh, editing and, um, and, uh, and publishing, which took some time. Um, it's a privilege to be here at the PO. And um, um, I'd like... <clears throat> to make your life a bit easier to skip my chapter when you, uh, when you read the book. I, I will summarize very briefly the main idea uh, with, that, that, that I wanted to, uh, to present in my chapter. <clears throat> Essentially, it's the idea that um, one can understand the events of, of the Lviv Pseudo Sobor, I prefer to call it this way, um, uh, against the backdrop of the political and uh, social, uh, social developments in the Soviet Union at the time. Um, those developments have been described in the sociology of religion as uh, a political religion. Um, this concept was coined in the uh, interwar period in Europe to describe primarily uh, fascism and Nazism and was also applied to uh, the left-wing totalitarian ideologies like communism at the time. Um, the basic idea of, um, of a political religion is that there is a political system, a system of ideas, political ideas and beliefs, uh, which um, can have a political nature, but they are believed. They are not just held as an idea. They are believed in the same way as people believe in religions. Uh, even though those political religions may reject religion per se, as it is the ca case with communism, uh, they nevertheless practice religion in, or they, they have some very clear features of, uh, of religion, like a cult, like uh, doctrines, like heresies, like uh, uh, um, uh, instruments or institutions of decision making <coughs> in the case of the Soviet of the Soviet ideology of, of the Soviet version of communism. It was like uh, the uh, meetings of the Communist Party, which looked like you know, the councils of the church. Uh, they venerated the relics, so to say, of Lenin and other leaders of the communist movement. They certainly upheld strictly the orthodoxy of Marxism, which they called Marxism-Leninism, Len and they rejected heresies of Marxism, such as Maoism, uh, Trotskyism and so forth. So there is there are clear resemblances between uh, between the Soviet uh, uh, ideology and and uh, well orthodoxy as as it was traditionally practiced um, in, um, in 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 the Russian Empire. So that is the phenomenon of political religion. Uh, which, uh, which one has to take into consideration while uh, considering uh, what was happening in, in the Soviet Union at the time. It is quite different from the concept of civil religion, which was coined a bit later on uh, and was applied primarily to, uh, to the situation in the West. It was first applied, well, of course, it was first coined by Jean-Jacques Rousseau and applied to the situation of, uh, of France uh, in the wake of the French Revolution, but then was successfully applied by uh, American sociologists of religion to describe the American civil religion. Uh, in both cases, we are dealing with political systems or political cultures which, um, which look like religions, but they are essentially about politics. There is, however, a difference between them. Uh, the difference is, the, the main kind of <coughs> divergence between them is uh, the way how they, um, uh, they convince people to uphold those religions. The political religions are usually coercive. They force, they uh, um, 
uh, exercise force. They coerce people to, be, to believe, to uphold those religions. The civil religions, they are not forceful. They are not coercive. They uh, function more like uh, you know, TV commercials. They uh, can be annoying. They pop up all the time. But essentially, they convince you to buy their product. Uh, they don't force you to buy their product. Unlike, with, unlike the political religions, which actually force you to buy this ideology, to buy into this ideology. Um, so the Soviet political religion, I believe, underpinned the Lviv Sobor of 1946. Because all the features of this uh, pseudo Sobor uh, stemmed somehow from this political culture of coercion as it was practiced across the Soviet Union at the time. Uh, that's why it was coercive. No one asked the, you know, the consent of the people who, of the Greek Catholic Church to uh, participate in, the, in this council. They were forced, as we know, uh, uh, to participate, <coughs> at least most of them. Uh, there were manipulations, there, were, there was coercion, and that's how the Greek Catholic Church disappeared as a result of, the, of coercion, as a result essential of a particular application of this uh, po uh, Soviet political religion to the case of the Greek Catholic Church. If we look now at, the, at what is going on in Ukraine, it is nothing else but another manifestation of the same Soviet political religion, coercive in its nature. Uh, it also functions in the capacity and with the features of a, a religion, well, now they call it the Russian world ideology, uh, which is just another incarnation of the old ideologies of the past upheld you know, in, the, in the Soviet Russia, before that uh, in the Tsarist Russia, uh, with the same uh, kind of feature uh, that unites all those incarnations of the same ideology. The, the main feature of this ideology is it's coercive. It forces people. Nowadays, it forces people to, you know, to uphold it through force, through, through the <coughs> danger of arrest in Russia, or through uh, bombardments in Ukraine, and so forth. That's why I think. Uh, the Lviv Sobor, pseudo Sobor, was not just a, a, an event happening in the past. It is relevant to our days in which sense? In the sense that it gives us a clue how to understand the present events. Why the church is coercive again? Why, why the church again co you know, contributes to, to this violence which is going on, which is, uh, uh, which is affecting not just Ukraine, but also Russia itself. Russia is now a kind of a kingdom of violence, or, or a kingdom <coughs> of coercion in many senses. So that's uh, something I wanted to emphasize um, as my first point, uh, my point number one. And my last point number two, which I wanted to say, is that um, um, nowadays uh, we are facing, we are witnessing different narratives that try to justify the war in Ukraine. Uh, those narratives come from the Kremlin and also from the church. Uh, all those narratives, they change all the time. If we see, if we look at the, if we look at the justifications for the war in the beginning of the war from Putin or from other speakers on behalf of, you know, of the Russian establishment, uh, they brought up one set of arguments. Now they are bringing up another set of arguments. So it's very uh, liquid. It's it's very unstable and inconsistent. The the torrent of arguments coming, you know, from from the propagand propagandists uh, for this war. Uh, there are some, however, there are some features in this torrent of arguments which still there, which remain there. One of them is unionism. They keep repeating that essentially what they're trying to do in Ukraine, they try to repel, to rebuke, even if in advance, you know, the advance of unionism. A popular thesis in the Russian propaganda is, look, uh, it's the West which is fighting for its own interests uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. And one of, them, of their interests is to impose uh, Roman Catholicism in Ukraine, to convert Ukraine to Roman Catholicism through unionism. <coughs> this, is a very, this is one of the you know, conspiracy theories, if you want, which circulate widely in Russia. And generally, I would say, if we look at the propaganda which is uh, urged you know, by the Russian speakers, uh, it's a sort of conspiracy theory, not very far from QAnon, you know, these conspiracy theories in, in, a, in, in a sense, because they believe in, you know, in a global government which is behind the scenes, and this global, global government wants, wants to impose you know, an agenda, uh, what wants to destroy Russia as the last kind of stronghold against the global uh, dominance of the, evil, of the evil forces. And uh, <laughs> Ukraine is a battlefield between this unseen global government of evil and Holy Rus, which stands against, against it. And according to this conspiracy theory, 
which is uh, propagated by many, including from the church, uh, the Catholic Church plays a kind of a key role. They believe that the, the Catholic Church is to a great extent behind this war of the West against Ukraine. That's why they say, look, uh, uh, the entire Ukrainian project by its nature, it's unitist. Because the, the purpose of Ukraine, of very existent of Ukraine, is to uh, challenge the Russian civilization, as they call it, and to impose, to replace orthodoxy, <coughs> substitute orthodoxy in Ukraine with unitism and in the ultimate kind of, uh, at the ultimate stage with, with the Catholic Church. This is a clear, a pure conspiracy theory, completely wrong, but it captivates, you know, the imagination of many in Russia and actually promotes, um, promotes this, um, uh, this sort of uh, worldview and this sort of explanations for the war. Uh, that's why I believe it is important to have this book, like this one, uh, to contest, to uh, uh, argue against those conspiracy theories that, you know, that what, 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 I've, des uh, what I've described. Uh, it's important in order to like, instill truth, even for our days. It's important for Ukraine to have this kind of arguments which I exposed in this, in, in this book. Uh, it's important to have this book as an important means of counter-propaganda, if you want. Um, and it's also important to, to have this book to uh, advance our dialogue. Because again, as you probably know, all of you know, the issue of unitism has become really an important impediment in the ongoing or, uh, Orthodox Catholic dialogue. It has become such an impediment since uh, the collapse of the so Soviet Union uh, in the early 90s. Uh, that's why in Balamant, when the, when the commission, uh, uh, joint commission Orthodox for Orthodox Catholic dialogue uh, met in Balamant, they adopted the declaration, an important Balamant declaration on unitism. That's why Actually, uh, the issue of unities was brought up to the dialogue again and again, all the time, every time. Sometimes this issue, in, well, uh, kind of put the dialogue on pause, like, like what it was in, ba in uh, Baltimore in 2000, when the uh, Joint Commission met in Baltimore, they again started discussing the issue of unitism. They disagreed on everything, primarily the Orthodox. The Orthodox with one another disagreed. And they actually decided to not to continue the dialogue. And the dialogue was, was, was resumed much later. Uh, in the dialogue, in the Orthodox Catholic, Catholic dialogue, my question is whether the issue of unitism is the reason to uh, impede the dialogue or it's an excuse to impede the dialogue. I personally believe it's rather an excuse. It's more an excuse than a reason. There are other reasons why the churches, some churches don't want, didn't want to continue the dialogue. But they somehow camouflaged this unwillingness to continue the dialogue by bringing up the issue of, of unitism. That's why the issue of unitism is like a, um, um, a screen smoke. It's like a, a pretext, like a pretension why we should, you know, not why we should not discuss real issues, really important for the Orthodox Catholic, Catholic dialogue. And the real issues are substituted with those false pretensions, and I believe unhelpful and uh, unreasonable uh, pretexts why we should discuss the, the issue of unitism instead of you know, going forward uh, in the dialogue. That's why I believe, well, the collapse of the, well, if we, I hope that, well, we in Ukraine, we, we, we will win eventually. I'm speaking as Ukrainian. Uh, then this will challenge the conspiracy theory that brings un unitism you know, to the core of the propaganda. I hope that the, this theory will collapse. Every, everyone will see its falseness. And it will help eventually to reinvigorate the dialogue, the Orthodox Catholic dialogue. The book like this one will be a very helpful contribution to both things to rebuke all those conspiracy theories, but also to invigorate the, the Orthodox Catholic dialogue. I hope this will be like that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Father Cyril. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you for connecting the events of 1946, not just to previous events from uh, centuries before, but also to the present day. Uh, and in 
provoking us to more dialogue. I should say at this point as well, uh, because of your choice of referring to it as a pseudo sabor, that the title for the book was chosen at the time of the conference as Lviv Sabor in quotation marks to be potentially acceptable to people on both sides. And in the end, it was not acceptable to both sides, and therefore the book will probably be have uh, many things that will be displeasing to everyone because the idea was to get people to the table what is necessary to bring them there. And so to refer to this as Lviv Sabot in quotation marks was not pleasing to representatives from the Moscow Patriarchate because it was putting this term in quotation marks as if it wasn't a real thing. And people from the Catholic side, especially the Ukrainian Greek Catholic side, did not want to refer to it as such. And even in the editing process, it was not uh, such a simple task. In any case, uh, thank you, Father Cyril. Our next speaker is uh, Father Yacint Estivel of the Order of Preachers, who is director of the Institute for Ecumenical Studies at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, the Angelicum here in Rome, with years, decades of experience in Orthodox Catholic dialogue, especially with the Roman Catholic Church and the Russian Orthodox Church, with time also uh, in St. Petersburg. So uh, thank you, Father Cyril, for co uh, Father uh, Yacinth, for coming. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Father Daniel, and thank you, Father Cyril, for your, uh, for your uh, talk. Uh, in this week of, of prayer for Christian unity, uh, it is perhaps good to remember that the healing of memory uh, is not only a matter of historical study, but also a spiritual challenge. As the 2017 Catholic Lutheran document entitled From Conflict to Communion states, I quote, what happened in the past cannot be changed. But what is remembered of the past and how it is remembered can, with the passage of time, indeed change. Remembrance makes the past present while the past itself is unalterable, the presence of the past in the present is alterable. I think it's a remarkable uh, reflection on after five centuries of conflict between Lutherans and Catholics uh, on this uh, concept of healing of memory. And the question of the events uh, that took place in Vif from 8th to 10th March 1946 undoubtedly remains one of the most painful in recent relations between the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, the Ruthenian Greek Catholic Church, as it was called in, at that time, and the Russian Orthodox Church. It is a deep wound for which only a common reading of history will allow a healing of memory. We can therefore only welcome the publication of the proceedings of the symposium organized in 2016 in Vienna on the occasion of the 70th anniversary of the Lviv Sabor, according to the terminology used by the organizers, symposium which aimed at a common reading of these events. The publication has taken a little delay, but it comes at the right time in the dramatic context that we all know it is also particularly timely in this week when we pray for Christian unity. The organizers of the conference has asked me to present the point of view of the Holy See, perhaps because I work, uh, I'm, I'm still work, uh, working in the uh, Dicastery for Promoting Unity. Uh, the reaction of the Holy See to the Lviv Sabor, to the Pseudo Sabor or Lviv, in other words, the reception uh, by the Holy See of this council. The purpose of my contribution was therefore very modest and circumscribed. It was to present the official declarations of the Holy See concerning the events of 1946, in particular those of the successive popes from Pius XII to Francis, but also those of the representatives of the Secretariat for Promoting Christian Unity, and to ask the following questions what was the nature of these statements? What do they say? How and why did they evolve? What were their main arguments? My contribution first analyzes the pontificate of Pius XII. 
His main reaction to the liquidation of the Greek Catholic Church was the encyclical Orientales Omnes Ecclesias of December 1945, which denounces the political justification of the persecution, whereas the, the deep motivation it's, is religious, namely the plan to incorporate the Greek Catholic Church into the Russian Orthodox Church. The encyclical criticizes in very direct terms, the letter that Petuach Alexi I had sent in May 1945 to the pastors and faithful of the Greek Catholic Church of Western Ukraine, inviting them to join the Orthodox Church. The encyclical Orientale, Orientales Omnes Ecclesias, however, was published before the events of the Lviv Sabor. The later text of Pius XII, in particular, is apostolic letter to all people of Russia, Sacro Vergente Anno of July 1952. By this letter, uh, Pius XII announced the consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, uh, the, the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And another encyclical, uh, Orientales Ecclesias to the bishops of the Eastern Churches, uh, written in December 1952. These two uh, texts do not directly mention the events of 1946, but do, of course, acknowledge the existence of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, which may appear as an implicit denial of the validity of the Sabor. The pontificate of Paul of Pope Paul VI was marked by a certain caution in the Ukrainian question. This seems to have been motivated by a double aspiration. On the one hand, not to aggravate the situation of the Greek Catholic Church in the catacombs by pronouncing a public condemnation of the persecution, and on the other hand, not to compromise the rapprochement between the Catholic Church and the Russian Orthodox Church since the Vatican, the Second Vatican Council. However, it would be probably a caricature to present this caution, often referred to by the term Vatican host politic, as the sacrifice of Eastern Catholic communities on the altar of ecumenism, or worse, of a cynical real politic. As my presentation shows, strong statements from the Holy See were made. The first occasion was an exchange of correspondence in 1968 between Paul VI and Patriarch Alexei of Moscow. This, has, this had as it, its object the Greek Catholic Church in Czechoslovakia, but also indirectly the Ukrainian events of 1946. In a letter to the Patriarch, Paul VI recalls two principles. First, the first is that of conciliarity. Paul VI recalls that for the Catholic Church, as for the Orthodox Church, no decision can be considered valid without the participation and acceptance of the bishops, which was lacking both in 1950 in Czechoslovakia at the equivalent uh, pseudo synod of Preshov, and in 1946 in Lviv. The second principle is freedom of conscience. Paul VI, as Pius XII did, but from a different point of view, recalls in this regard the importance of distinguishing between religious factors arising from personal conviction and political factors. A second statement by the Holy See under the pontificate of Paul VI regarding the Sabor came on the occasion of the 1971 Council of the Russian Orthodox Church, which ratified the so-called reunification of 1946. Cardinal Willebrands, who was attending this council as an ecumenical guest, uh, declared in an important interview that the Catholic Church could not accept such a unilateral solution Thank you. to the ecclesial situation of the Greek Catholics. 
The first years of the pontificate of Pope St. John Paul II were marked by two incidents on this subject, which gave rise to a correspondence between the Holy See and the Moscow Patriarchate. The first exchange of correspondence took place on the occasion of, the letter from, of a letter from John Paul II to Cardinal Sleepy in 1979, letter which referred at length to the Union of Brest of 1596. This letter was criticized by Metropolitan Juvenal, then president of the Department of External Church Relations of the Moscow Patriarchate. Cardinal Villebrands, in his response to the Metropolitan, formulated the principles which were to remain those of the Holy See under the pontificate of Paul the, John Paul II, namely, first, the distinction between the historical method of union and the effective existence of the United Churches, and second, the distinction between the religious and political spheres. Another incident took place shortly after in 1980, which more specifically concerned the Lviv Sabor, and which provoked direct correspondence between Jean Paul II and Patriarch Pimen. The new political context of perestroika and the preparation of the celebration of the millennium of the baptism of the Rus offered the opportunity to deepen these positions. In 1988, in addition to the letter Iuntes in Mundum for the millennium of the baptism of Rus, John Paul II addressed the message Magnum Baptismi Domum to Ukrainian Catholics. Against distinguishing between the historical method of union and the reality of the Greek Catholic churches, which had already been sketched by Cardinal Villebrands, the letter emphasized the ecumenical vocation of the Greek Catholic churches. My contribution ends with, uh, my contribution in the book ends with, uh, with a presentation of the most recent presentation, uh, uh, declarations. In February 2006, Benedict XVI was actually to my knowledge, the first pope to explicitly mention the synodal vif and formally deny its canonicity, calling it a pseudo-synod. In his letter to Cardinal Hussar on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of this event. Ten years later, in his message of 5th March 9, 2016 to his beatitude, Archbishop Sviatoslav Shevchuk, for the same anniversary, Pope Francis reiterated the same expression of pseudo-synod. I quote, in these days, the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church commemorates the painful events of March 1946. 70 years ago, the ideological and political context, as well as ideas opposed to the very existence of your church, led to the organization of a pseudo-synod in Lviv, causing decades of suffering for pastors and faithful. End of quote. After this uh, analysis of the official reactions of the Holy See to the events of 1946, my article summarizes the main lines of these reactions. It should first be noted that before 2006, the Holy See never officially and directly pronounced on the Lviv Sabor as such, even less on its canonicity. Nevertheless, the Holy See has always recognized, of course, the existence of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, not only in the diaspora, but in Ukraine itself, which can be considered as an indi indirect denial of the validity of the Sabor. The five main lines of arguments of the Holy See were as follows. First, the distinction between the political and religious spheres, as we have seen, in the encyclical Orientales Omnes Ecclesias Pius XII was already denouncing the political pretext of measures which were in reality of an ecclesial nature. Likewise, Paul VI, in his letter to Patriarch Alexei, emphasized the religious nature, not the political or national character of membership of in the Greek Catholic Church. In other words, sanctions against political acts of a few cannot have the effect of depriving an entire people of their religious rights. Second, the principle of freedom of conscience. 
This principle was already mentioned by Paul VI in 1968 and would be particularly developed by John Paul II, relying first on the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights in, of 1948 and then on the Helsinki ag agreements. Third, the absence of bishops at the Sabor. This fact is denounced in the letter of, Paul the, of Pope Paul VI to Patriarch Alexei in 1968 as a lack of conciliarity. We would say today perhaps of synodality or collegiality and seems to be an implicit assertion of the non-canonical status of the synod. Fourth, the unilateral character of the decision of the Moscow Patriarchate to abolish the Union of Brest was highlighted in 1971 by Cardinal Villebrandt particularly in the new context of ecumenical dialogue established following the Second Vatican Council. Fifth, the distinction between the historic method of union, so-called unitism, and the actual existence of Eastern Catholic churches. This distinction is first made explicitly in Cardinal Villebrand's letter of 1979 and repeated, as Father Cyril mentioned, in 1993 in the famous Balaman document whose 30th anniversary we commemorate this year. To this distinction must be added the mention of the particular ecumenical vocation of the Eastern Catholic Churches, in particular in that they show that the Latin tradition is not the only Catholic tradition. These are some very modest conclusions that we can draw from this historical overview, which beyond the mere consideration of the reactions of the Holy See to these tragic events, allow us to outline also the prospects for a healing of memory based on a shared reading of history. In his apostolic letter on the occasion of the fourth century, centenary of the Union of Brest, John Paul II wrote the following words, which we quote to conclude. I quote, prayer will therefore be the fundamental element which should mark the celebration of this jubilee. Such prayer is a plea for the gift of, brother, of brotherly love and for the forgiveness of offenses and injustices suffered in the course of history. It is a petition that the power of the living God will bring good even out of the cruel and many-faced evil caused by acts of human malice. This prayer also expresses hope for the future of the ecumenical journey. The power of God is greater than all human weaknesses, whether old or new. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Yacent, for this clear um, overview of the Holy See's response and also this challenge for moving forward. Our next speaker is uh, Father Thomas Mark Nemeth, who is Professor of Theology of the Eastern Churches at the Catholic Theology Faculty of the University of Vienna. He's also a consultor of Pro Oriente and a member of its steering committee for Orthodox Catholic Dialogue and a co-chair of the Orthodox Eastern Catholic Dialogue Group, which is a relatively new initiative. So Father Thomas joins us from his office in Vienna. The floor is, the microphone is yours, Father. Reverend Fathers, dear ladies and gentlemen, I hope you can hear me, yes? Yes. I am thankful for the invitation to speak at the Pontifical Oriental Institute about some aspects of the book, The Lviv Sobor of 1946 and its aftermath, which will be presented now. This volume was partially also produced with the support of the Pro Oriente Foundation in Vienna, and it is my pleasure to greet you also in the name of the board of uh, Pro Oriente. I am glad that I could contribute to this book and would like to refer my short presentation to the chapter Canonical Considerations on the Legitimacy of the Lviv Sobor of 1946, which I wrote together with Bishop Theodor Martiniuk, 
who is visiting professor at the PO and auxiliary bishop of the Ternopils Borib Archivage of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. The subtitle of the book Towards Truth and Reconciliation shows that it aims to contribute to a historical founded understanding of the events of 1946 in order to find a common narrative and to a healing of memories and reconciliation. One of the most contentious issues concerning the reception of the events of 1946 is the question of canonicity and legitimacy. First, the nature of the Sobor, which consisted uh, of three bishops of the Russian Orthodox Church, 216 priests and 19 laymen of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, who voted to declare a reunion with the Russian Orthodox Church, raises the question of synodality. And our contribution analyzes the events of 46 in the context of early canonical legislation, such as the Council of Trullo or the Seven Ecumenical Council, which viewed the interference of civil authorities in church life as a problem, as well as of Catholic canon law at the end of 19th and beginning of the 20th century, which established the norms by which a synod or council of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church could have been convened at that time. We examine the state uh, of canon law regarding synods and councils at this time in the metropolitan of Lviv, taking also into consideration the canonical norms of the Roman Catholic Church and the preparation, convocation, chairmanship, agenda, discussion of the Sobor, as well as the documents adopted, reveal not only several uncanonical elements, but in fact a complete absence of any basis for it to be considered a canonical church council. So from a scholarly perspective, it is still true what the Ukrainian Canadian political scientist and church historian Bogdan Botsyurki stated in his monograph that the Sobor was not convened by a legitimate church outreach, that the initiative group leaders were not longer members of the church who they pretended to represent, the delegates were not elected, no bishop of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church uh, was present. Arbitrarily appointed representatives of the Russian Orthodox Churches participated and the Soviet authorities intimidated the participants. So uh, this gathering also contradicted Soviet law on the separation of church and state. Uh, if we look at canonical requirements, a provincial synod should be headed by a metropolitan and without his consent, no bishop can or should act in a manner that would affect the affairs of the metropolitan, who is uh, considered the protos and should be treated as the head. This is clear from the ancient canons. Um, furthermore, the 1891 Lviv Synod clearly emphasized that it should be headed by a metropolitan, but instead the priest Gabriel Kostel, who had joined the Russian Orthodox Church headed the Lviv gathering, and some of the delegates of the pseudo Sobo were formerly already members of the Russian Orthodox Church. Yet, consequently, this gathering can in no way be called a Greek Catholic. Because the topics of discussion during the pseudo Sobor were defined by the NKGB, the official agenda did not include matters of faith, of morals, discipline, but was aimed at proclaiming schism, uh, that means the accession of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church to the Russian Orthodox Church. Therefore, the so-called decisions of the Sobor did not have any canonical force, and it is clear that they could not have, that they could not been have any talk about its approbation by the uh, Roman pontiff. Well, Orthodox side, a response to the question of canonicity came uh, from Metropolitan uh, than Kirill uh, Gundyayev of the Department for Extant Church Relations of the Russian Orthodox in 2006, now Patriarch of Moscow. And uh, he claimed that he regarded the question of canonicity of the Sovereign as not entirely constructive, stating that the Russian Orthodox Church could raise the same questions uh, for the Union of Brest. And the former head of the Department for Extant the Church Relations of the Russian Orthodox Church Metropolitan, Ilarion Alfeyev, uh, also recently claimed that the Catholic use of the term pseudo-sobor is a sign of a considerable difference between Orthodox and Catholic Christians. The 
Clinton did not deny the political interference in the liquidation of the Ukrainian Catholic Church, but he does not regard the conversions to orthodoxy in connection with the Sober as entirely coerced. This book now will clarify that the repeated comparison between the events of the uh, Brest Union and 1946 by the Moscow Patriarchate failed to acknowledge that the perspective of the Russian Orthodox Church is confessional and anachronistic in the light of most recent research. Perhaps the most courageous step in a declaration signed by 22 Orthodox Christians, among them priests and theologians, published in March 2016, that states that, let me quote, all serious historians and theologians have no doubt that this synod of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church at Lviv was only a sham. And they concluded with the request, let me quote it, we humbly ask their pardon for all the injustices they have suffered under the cover of the Orthodox Church, and we bow down before the martyrs of this Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. End of quotation. In contrast, to the Russian Orthodox Church and the Ukrainian Orthodox Church Moscow Patriarchate statements defending the legitimacy of the Lviv Sobor, a different emphasis can be found in Vladislav Tsipin's history of the Russian Church. Tsipin is one of the chief canonists of the Russian Orthodox Church and he distances himself from the affirmation of the canonicity of the Sobor. He admitted that other Orthodox authors regarded the Sobor as uncanonical and unlawful and noted that there are no norms for a change of confession between Catholics and the Orthodox Church because of the lack of ecclesial communion and the common canonical base. Even assuming all Greek Catholic bishops had not been arrested and could have participated at the Lviv Sobor would have been regarded as uncanonical by the Catholic Church. On the other hand, if only lay people had been present at the Sobor, the Orthodox Church would have no right to refuse their conversion. For Tsipin, let me quote, the Lviv Sobor is not a Sobor of an Orthodox local church in the canonical sense of the word. This means that it had only authority for the participants, for those who agreed with its decisions, but not for those who remained unions out of conviction. End of quotation. Even if Tsipin's historical explanations reflects Soviet historiography, his opinion regarding the gathering's canonicity could contribute to a more objective evaluation. It is impossible to argue for the formal canonicity of the Lviv Sobor. It was not a movement of true conversions back to orthodoxy, except perhaps in individual cases, although even the motivation of the members of the initiative group is still not full clear. In any case, to consider the Lviv Sobor as an opportunity for the people in Galicia to finally to return to orthodoxy is inconsistent with the historical facts. Let me conclude. In our contribution from 2019, we note it still quite optimistically. Let me quote, the events of 1946 raise many questions which require careful examination from all churches concerned. Formal canonical criteria for the recognition of synodal decisions have a so that reception remains the decisive factor. In the case of the Lviv Sobor, the final word has not been said. What remains open is the possibility of the Russian Orthodox Church engaging in a critical re-reading of its history and undertaking a new commitment to Christian unity grounded in a common narrative regarding the events of 46. End of quotation. We also raised the question why the Russian Orthodox Church seemed to feel a need to continue to defend the legitimacy of this coerced gathering as an ecclesial act since the actual violence by the Soviet state cannot be denied anymore. The editors of the book argued in the introduction that many of the Russian side were not and are not yet repaired and equipped to grapple with history and theology done outside the very narrow confines of post-Soviet religiosity and Putin as historiography. But after almost a year of a war against Russia and the behavior of the Russian Orthodox Church leadership and its narratives, we can now better understand why there was no openness to contribute to a common understanding at the conference in Vienna in 2016 that there will be none under the current church leadership. The long shadows of the past and the lack of coming to terms with it are still present. Despite all these difficulties, open and critical research can be an opportunity for all concerned. Since 2019, there is an Orthodox Eastern Catholic Dialogue Group, OEC, see the book Stolen Churches or Bridges to Orthodoxy. I'm a member of its board, and we try to promote such a dialogue, which was also present at the 
uh, Volos conference recently. So I hope this book will become a starting point for scholars on both sides towards truth and reconciliation. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Father Thomas, for joining us online and for s summarizing the uh, canonical positions on this question. And as you mentioned, um, the review of history, it's worth noting also that even recent publications from uh, Russia published, for example, in 2009 in Moscow, the letters of Patriarch Alexei I uh, to the Council of Russian Orthodox Church Affairs at the Russian uh, the Council of People's Commissars uh, explicitly points out that he was even posing the question himself before 1946, are eparchial gatherings necessary? Um, and it's worth asking uh, colleagues uh, who deal with this history from the perspective of the Russian Orthodox side for commentary on that. But um, thank you, Father Thomas. We now pass to Father Yuri Avakumov, who also joins us online. Uh, Father Yuri is Associate Professor of Theology and History of Christianity at the University of Notre Dame in the United States uh, and joins us online. He, at the conference, he presented, as, uh, along with uh, Professor Antoine Arzhakovsky, perspectives for moving forward uh, from this, these wounds of the past towards healing in the future. So thank you, Father Yuri, for joining us. And the microphone is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to say many thanks to the organizers of the conference and to the volume editors for all the great work they accomplished. Uh, I feel privileged to be able to participate in the conference and to contribute to this volume. My contribution to the volume has the title Brest 1596 and Lviv 1946 between historiography and propaganda ecumenical lessons of the two dramatic events in church history. And uh, basically, it is devoted to the uh, failure and deficits of the ecumenical dialogue, and more broadly, to the failures of theology in approaching these two historical events and uh, the realities they produced. Uh, my point was that we cannot move forward uh, if we do not uh, become clear about uh, the problems, uh, deficits, and uh, failures of uh, uh, our preceding efforts. And by comparing the achievements of historical research with the practice and reality of ecumenical official conversations, I have come to the conclusion that there have been quite a few serious deficits in ecumenical interactions that prevented the dialogue on the pseudo council in, of Lviv, as well as the Catholic Orthodox dialogue in general, from reaching the goal of reconciliation and mutual understanding. Today, a few years has passed since the conference and in the current historical moment, in the time of a full-scale war that Russia launched against Ukraine, I think this volume acquires a special meaning. Prior to the events of the last year, Ukrainians were warning the world, uh, particularly Europe, of the imminent dangers and threats coming from resurgent and revanchist Russian imperialism. The history of the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church in the 20th century is clearly an example of what can happen to a religious community who does not fit into the imperial and totalitarian political structure. However, only very few people listened to the warnings of Ukrainians prior to the war. Let us be honest. Today, the situation has changed. and Many of those who did not want to hear have classed see that Ukrainians deserved to be heard. Perhaps the most well-known example is the case of the president of Germany, Frank-Walter Steinmeier, who had to acknowledge the grave mistakes and failures of German foreign, foreign policy. Regrettably, we don't see many similar steps on part of professional ecumenists 
and ecclesiastical leadership. The roots of these deficits and failures, uh, this highly problematic approach, lie in the global focus, even fixation, I would say, of contemporary Catholic Orthodox and Protestant Orthodox ecumenism on the Russian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate, which is considered to be the largest and the most powerful, if not the so truly powerful, Orthodox Church in the world. The image that clearly has much to do with the grand narratives about the power and influence of the Russian Tsarist colonial empire and of its paradoxical but no less imperial and colonial successor, the Soviet Union. At times, the Russian Orthodox Church acquires highly romanticized, overblown, almost mythical features in the eyes of some Western theologians and ecumenists. In this half mythical picture, Ukrainians and their stunning confessional diversity disappear as an insignificant footnote to the grand narrative of Russian Orthodox. Thus, the deficit in theology and church history is clearly a considerable one, and there is much that still should be done about it. And I think this volume should be seen as a continuous and warning addressed primarily to current ecumenical policies. A warning reminding of the necessity of a complete revision of the type and style of Catholic Orthodox relations as they were practiced during the decades of the Cold War and the initial decades of the 21st century. In this context, I would like to draw your attention to the parallels between political and ecclesiastical behavior. The models of thought and approaches are clearly similar here and there. The main thesis of the Russian propaganda today is that Ukrainians are an invented nation that they have no right to exist independently from Russia. They are no more than a part of the Russian nation, a sort of folkloric subspecies on the fringes of the Russian state. The slogan of, the, of one holy Rus that has been propagated by the leadership of the Moscow Patriarchate denies Ukrainians and Belarusians their right for independence, the political independence from the Kremlin and the cultural and religious independence from the Church of the Moscow Patriarch. Moreover, the slogan has a clear racist undertone, since it approaches the two neighboring nations, Ukrainians and Belarusians, and these nations as a whole, as a sort of imperfect Russians, little Russians, sub-Russians, not worthy of being recognized as genuine nations. Something similar happened in Lviv in 1946, Greek Catholics were denied the right to exist as, a, as an independent, as a genuine ecclesiastical community. They were declared a part of the Russian Orthodox. Everyone who did not agree with this had to be exterminated or sent to gulags. Or take the methods, the way how it was done. Today we are being told that Russia conducts a special operation on the territory of Ukraine. In reality, this is, of course, a full-scale war, but the very idea of a special operation of the secret services is so typical for the Russian mentality formed in this Soviet period. If we turn to the history of the Lviv pseudo sobot its real history, we will see that it was conducted precisely as a special operation of the Soviet secret police. Facing this reality, we must be wary of taking pseudo-theological constructs for pure theology. We, precisely as theologians and church historians, must be prepared to expose the presence of an aggressive and militaristic political message within the constructs that might sound as pious, well-minded, and even otherworldly at first glance. And here, uh, was exactly one of my points in my contribution concerning the significance of confessionalism, of its new contemporary forms uh, uh, preventing the uh, honesty and the openness of the ecumenical dialogue. 
And let me make my final very brief point. Uh, this point will be taken from the perspective of Eastern European studies, of which church history of Eastern Europe is a part. Uh, I would like to say a word in favor of a morally engaged research. In the context of the Russia's war against Ukraine, in the context of the historical issues and problems like the issue of the uh, Lviv pseudo sobor of 1946, and in the time when so many people and scholars among them take sides in this conflict, in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, we hear voices in the academic community warning us against political engagement and research and underscoring the necessity of scientific objectivity. Absolutely supporting the objectivity requirement in the humanities in the sense that it is our obligation to follow our sources in our research. Let me, however, call for a deeper look at the issue. The dichotomy, either political engagement or objectivity in research, seems to me is insufficient. Political engagement is not the only option. We should add a third member to the picture, moral engagement. And there are particular cases in which moral engagement is not only permitted, but indispensable. It is especially true for the area of church history and theology. The dark, allow me to say almost diabolical nature of the Putinist ideology and the Putinist church must be named by name. The ability to distinguish between the right and the wrong, and if you like, take sides with the right cause, belongs, in my view, to the foundational aspects of any honest research endeavor in the humanities, and of course, in church history and historical theology. In my understanding, this volume is clearly an example of such honest and morally engaged research endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, Father Yuri, for joining us and for um, not just comparing 1596 and 1946, which we can read about more in your chapter, but also with these challenges to uh, our situation today, uh, pointing out deficits in dialogue and an advocacy for morally engaged uh, research of history. So thank you. Uh, before I open the floor to discussion or questions, I should not just thank the four speakers that have joined us today, although sincerely thank you for presenting your work to a greater public and giving us a summary and uh, kind of perspectives for future engagement with this topic, but also the people involved in organizing the conference in 2016 in Vienna, uh, Dr. Marte, at that time the president of Pro Oriente, Regina Augustin and Bernd Musinghoff, um, as well as editors at Peters at Eastern Christian Studies, where this volume was at the, at the time when it was submitted for publication, and then it wasn't 40 years in the desert, but it was a migration with Eastern Christian Studies from Peters to Brill. So I thank the editors both at uh, Peters and Brill, and especially uh, my co-editor for this volume, uh, Dr. Adam DeVille. So at this point, um, we now have some time for uh, questions and discussion. All those uh, uh, wishing to engage in this discussion, please come forward and, and uh, speak from the microphone here so that uh, the people participating in the live stream or in the video later on can also hear so that the, the uh, audio is recorded. So the floor is open uh, whether for, to questions for clarification on the events from 1946 or questions about ecumenical dialogue today, ways of moving forward from your own experiences. I know we have a hall with uh, some experts on specifically the 20th century, and not just ecumenical dialogue, but also church history uh, of the period. So, um, yeah, Professor Kalkanjiva. And please, when you come forward, uh, state your name uh, for the benefit of the public. Th th 
thank you very much for the presentation of this wonderful volume. Indeed, it would be much nicer to have it a year earlier. Maybe, maybe things could be different now. Because um, I had some opportunity the last uh, day to, to, to read some of the chapters and uh, to, to reflect a little bit on them. So I found one of the major, so, so this volume offers new sources. It also allows international audience to read the contribution of Ukrainian researchers done in Ukrainian language uh, in these last years. Uh, but now, thanks to the analysis of uh, our colleagues, now the audience throughout the world will have access to this uh, work done by Ukrainian scholars. The other thing which I very much appreciate, this is maybe the first work on the Lviv Pseudo uh, Sabor, which, uh, he, uh, which is engaged with its aftermath. Most of the studies were done on the Sabor, historical, ideological, polemical studies, but here we have a variety of perspectives, of approaches, and this is a kind of attempt for uh, interdisciplinary research. And I think this book can be easily used not only in theological faculties, but also by historic, uh, uh, in uh, faculties of history, political sciences, sociology, anthropology. For example, I was very much impressed by the chapter of Natalia Schlichter, who I know personally from our, uh, we studied together at the Central European University. Uh, the way she reflects on the impact of this, sub, uh, this event, the, the, uh, this act, uh, on the, within the Greek Catholic uh, community in Ukraine. And at the same time, while reading some of the chapters and some parts of the book, I read it through the lens, I uh, the course I read this semester in the, at uh, Pio, on the Russian Orthodox Church and its international affairs. And my, uh, uh, my attempt was, um, uh, my, my, uh, um, I was very much interested by this uh, interplay between politics and ecclesiology. And uh, uh, for example, I, I have now more questions. Actually, thank you very much because this is a book that I think will trigger another wave of research. Because for example, I ask myself, what will be to compare the compromise which Metropolitan Sergei did in 27 and the compromise which part of the Greek Catholic priest did in 46? And the fact that the Greek Catholic Church in Ukraine recovers so quickly and we see what kind of problems faces the Russian Orthodox Church today in addressing the problem of the war in Ukraine. This is one thing. So, so I think it is a, a, a one a very important uh, the, uh, direction of research. Another uh, direction could be this uh, issue of uh, unit, unitism uh, and orthodoxization of the Russian, uh, of the Greek Catholic Church made uh, by the Moscow Patriarchate in KGB in 1946. Uh, because we can discuss this through the prism, uh, in a broader context, the policy of reunion undertaken by the Russian Orthodox Church actually already in 1940 when it reunited the Latvian and Estonian churches 
then under Constantinople Patriarchate, and then after the Second World War, uh, continuing with the attempts, uh, more or less uh, uh, successful or, or, or not, to reunite uh, Russian Orthodox immigration, like the uh, attempt uh, with the Metropolitan uh, Evlogi in Paris, or the reun reunion of uh, uh, Orthodox uh, uh, communities in Czechoslovakia. In Czechoslovakia, I don't speak only about the uh, Russian uh, emigres there, but the others. So, so this unitism of the Moscow Patriarchate from the 40s could be uh, 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 also read through this uh, problem of reunion policy of the Moscow Patriarchate, or in the context of its attitude to the imperial legacy of the Russian Orthodox Church. So the, 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 the volume raises many questions, and I'll uh, need more time to reflect on it, but my first reading is uh, very, very inspiring, and I think it will be a w wonderful, uh, many of the chapters will be a wonderful for discussing with the students next academic year or already the next semester. So thank you very much to all the contributors. Thank you, Professor Kalkanjieva, for making connections also with previous years uh, in the 40s of um, the Rus Russian Orthodox Church and the Baltic states. Um, I have a question uh, perhaps to the, the participants of the panel today. Um, we heard about challenges to move forward to, uh, with dialogue. Um, all of you have experience with ecumenical dialogue. In the organization of this conference, the goal was to uh, invite, if one can say, both sides to the table. Uh, but instead of a dialogue, it kind of became a monologue. Christians are called to pray. Of course, we're all supposed to pray for unity, but what would be an approach as a historian or a theologian to continue to move forward um, in this attempt to somehow dialogue when, um, let's say, one side is not so eager to uh, confront uh, the situation? I don't know if either of you have comments or if the participants online or if people in our public. I know we have... Uh, we had some people engaged also in uh, Western uh, Christian churches dialogue. Father Cyril. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this question. Well, a short answer to this question is that we should not follow uh, uh, the Soviet Union in coercing, you know, the side that doesn't want to participate in the dialogue to participation in the dialogue. Right? We should not follow the in the steps of this pseudo council. Um, uh, that's why, uh, well, if they don't want to, to join the dialogue, join the discussion, well, what can we do? Uh, at the same time, I believe um, uh, there is a bigger picture uh, of ecumenism which is emerging as a result of this war. Um, my understanding is that there are two competing models for the dialogue which are now kind of standing next to each other. One is the, uh, to, to, to continue with ecumenism, with the ecumenical undertakings, as uh, the bu business as usual, as nothing has happened. Uh, I, mean, I mean the war, primarily. Uh, to, well, to acknowledge the war somehow, but to, to keep those two things, ecumenism and the war, separately from one another. That's one attitude, that's one model attitude, uh, approach. Uh, another approach, which I personally advocate for, is that, well, I believe ecumenism, as usual, is not, is not possible anymore as a result of this war. Um, um, this war probably um, gives us a chance, a kairos, to use the ecumenical language, uh, to reconsider maybe some uh, premises for the dialogue uh, and to reshape the dialogue properly, to distance ourselves from the dialogue as it existed before the war, and then to look at it from a distance, and then to see, uh, to decide, to re-evaluate, to revisit it, and to, to decide what can be changed for the better of the dialogue. Uh, 
Can we just continue talking with the Russian church as if nothing has happened, as if the church has not contributed to the war? Will it be helpful for the dialogue? I don't believe so. Uh, I think uh, uh, those who are involved in ecumenism should really pose this question seriously for themselves and answer this question. Uh, how the paradigm, how the attitude can be changed. And I think it is um, what we as, as the ecumenical partners, so to say, probably need to take into consideration, to, to, con to consider applying, is that it is a kairos to uh, not to punish one of the partners of the dialogue, which is a wrong attitude. It's not about punishing the Russian church for what it is doing. It's about uh, encouraging people who represent the church, who, or who, are, who do not represent the church, but who as affiliate themselves with the church, to change their mind. And I should remind that the Greek word for changing mind is metanoia, repentance. It's a kairos to encourage repentance. Uh, for the things that have been done with the input from some churches. Um, this is painful, I know, and it's, uh, it, it will require uh, some insistence and maybe some sacrifices, but it can be also beneficial. I believe this is the way how we can actually overcome the impasse, the ecumenical impasse we are facing, because since long time, quite long time ago, they are talking, they've been talking in the WCC and in other ecumenical, ecumenical organizations about the ecumenical winter, ecumenical fatigue, that they need to rediscover, you know, the ecumenical raison d'etre for themselves. What is the purpose of doing ecumenism? Ecumenism, to some extent, has been reduced, you know, to social activities like to help poor, or, you know, to address some issues that emerge in the glo global south, whatever. And some people were losing the meaning of, you know, ecumenism, why we do this. And probably this war can give us back the meaning of ecumenism, this raison d'etre, why we are doing this, what is the purpose of, this, uh, uh, of these activities. And if we take seriously the war and its consequences, if we uh, are concerned, if we really become concerned about the church's participation in the war. This can open doors or reopen doors to new achievements in our joint ecumenical endeavor. In other words, if we continue doing ecumenism as usual, we will keep facing the same old problems of ecumenical movement. If we reconsider the premises of ecumenism, given the opportunity coming from the war, well, the war unfortunately uh, or fortunately, it's not just a tragedy, it's also an opportunity sometimes, and it could be an opportunity for the ecumenical movement. Then we could really reinvigorate the, our ecumenical uh, commitments. Thank you, Father Cyril. I'm not sure if Father Yassent or uh, online I see uh, Father Thomas. So, um, yes, uh, please go ahead, uh, Father yes, Yassent. Uh, just a, a reflection. Actually, the, the ecumenical movement has always been the fruit of the war. Uh, life and work, uh, faith and order were born after, as a response to the First World War, somehow. The Ecumenical Council was founded in '48, after the Second World War. The CEC was founded during the Cold War. So, in order to put people together also, and to uh, reflect on uh, well, faith and order and life and work, it was mainly to uh, address the challenge of the ec ec ecclesiastic nationalism. Yes. So it was all somehow the, the Western uh, equivalent of uh, philatism, but which emerged during the First World War. So uh, somehow, the, or we can put it in another way, the ecumenical movement wa was born uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a, a movement for peace. So somehow, uh, again, we are in this context. So it is perhaps an opportunity also, of course, to reinvent the ecumenical movement. But uh, we are forced, we are uh, challenged by, by this context of war again. 
Brother Thomas. Yes, thank you uh, for the question. Uh, I would like to stress that the Orthodox Eastern Catholic has already begun as we experienced at the Wallace Conference. So we can see this increasing exchange in academy uh, in the last two decades where we can see a movement from below, which of course must reach the hierarchy, but uh, there is a growing understanding to get away from the paradigmas uh, of unionism and to, to face the churches. And if we can see the churches and meet them, then we, we can see that the Eastern Catholic churches don't have to uh, decide where they belong and that they are not children who must ask their parents uh, what to do. So we can see the steps in this direction and uh, the publication, I mentioned one, uh, by this dialogue group OEC, but also by Peter de May in the last year, a very important uh, volume. Uh, I think uh, we contribute to that that more and more Orthodox theologians are linked to this process, and there are very interesting uh, contributions, for example, by uh, uh, Keramidas in this uh, book, which uh, also shows that there is a growing taking seriously. Uh, also ecclesiology on the Catholic side, including the Eastern Catholic churches, which means that they are not regarded, of course, as bridges. I also don't regard them as such, but that they have really an important role in the Catholic uh, community, which can indirectly also contribute uh, to a better understanding, common understanding with the Orthodox. So I really see things uh, moving here. And uh, I, I think that this book will also contribute to this process. Thank you, Father Thomas. The, the gathering uh, here was intended to give the opportunity for dialogue and discussion, which we, there was lively discussion, I can confirm that, in Vienna in 2016, especially since some participants who also have experience in ecumenical dialogue uh, understood the absence of the uh, representatives from the Moscow Patriarchate required somebody to act as uh, devil's advocate and pose difficult questions. So please don't be shy uh, to come to the podium and ask your questions. If not, then, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, Dr. Tatyana Yevseyeva is a visiting scholar here from Kyiv, from the uh, Ukrainian Academy of Sciences. Я перепрошую, шановне панство, я буду говорити українською мовою. Я впевнена, що люди, які досліджували греко-католицьку церкву, українську мову. Я хочу привітати насамперед з такою прекрасною книгою. First of all, I'd like to, uh, well, to greet you for coming here and also to greet the, uh, for the publication of this beautiful book. Я впевнена, що люди, які працюють з тематикою 46-го року греко-католицькою церквою, українською мовою володіють без перекладу, тому буду говорити українською. Well, I'm sure that people who uh, work in, the, uh, in this field of, uh, of the Greek Catholic Church, uh, they, some, of, some of you knew, uh, know Ukrainian, can speak Ukrainian, so she will be speaking Ukrainian. I will be translating for those who are not in the field into English. Отже, моє питання. Наскільки я розумію, переважно дискусія точиться навколо протистояння з Російською Православною Церквою. As far as I understand, the discussion is, uh, uh, is regarding the um, counterposition uh, with the Russian Orthodox Church. Мене, як дослідника останні роки переважно повсякденного життя православного духовенства в радянській Україні, цікавить протистояння трохи інших контекстів. Як дослідник життя Орфокської кледжі, особливо в Совєтній період, я цікавлююся в деяких питаннях. Я так розумію, що 1946 рік – це рік зіткнення на Російської Православної Церкви і радянського комуносоціалізму із спадщиною митрополита Андрея Шептицького і з християнським соціалізмом європейським, який був 
маніфестований Папою Левом XIII у енцикліці «Рером Новарм». As far as I understand, this uh, uh, council in 1946 is a result of the, uh, uh, of the argument of the uh, uh, counterposition between the uh, Russian Orthodoxy and the uh, uh, Soviet state on the one hand and the uh, legacy of uh, Metropolitan Andriy Sheptitsky and the Christian socialism, especially as it was articul had been articulated in uh, Leo XIII's encyclical Rerum Novarum. Наскільки я знаю, в 19 столітті російська православна церква виявилася абсолютно безсилою і непідготовленою ні в конкуренції з християнським соціалізмом католицької церкви, ні з, Марксовою, ні з марксовим варіантом соціалізму. Мені було б е, цікаво дізнатися, як в радянські часи довелося протистояти населенню, яке вже до 1939 року, як мінімум, жило в умовах християнського соціалізму і жило в умовах становлення українського бізнесу, поціновування приватної власності, оскільки потім прийшов Радянський Союз, приніс своє обезвласнене суспільство, приніс свої колгоспи, і це протистояння було, окрім політики і економіки, ще і на богословському рівні. So, uh, as, far as, I, as far as I understand, the Russian church failed in the 19th century to, uh, to deal with, to uh, successfully address the issues that emerged and the approaches that emerged from uh, both the Christian socialism from the West and the Marxist version of socialism. Uh, so when the uh, population in Western Ukraine that had an experience of living under the circumstances of the Christian so socialism, um, as she suggests, um, and also had an experience of, uh, uh, of private business, of uh, uh, private entrepreneurship, uh, when they were uh, taken over by the Soviet state, and the Soviet state brought to them a uh, collective uh, economy, uh, deprivation of private, uh, private property and so forth, how, uh, uh, how, this, how they, they found the, their way, how they, this clash uh, was lived through, how it was faced. Thank you. Так, 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 це питання до, до всіх учасників so і насамперед до, до автора uh, книжки. Дякую. Question Дякую. 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 There was a certain level of enthusiasm, I would say, among some of the participants in the gathering in 1946, a certain maybe naivety, despite experience of Soviet occupation from 1939 until 1941. The leader of the uh, initiative group, uh, Father Havril Kostelnik, was a uh, very well-educated uh, professor of the Lviv Theological Academy, at the time, writing on questions such as Einstein or um, contemporary questions in uh, Western theology. And it seemed that there was a bit of uh, naivety on his part, looking to uh, the Orthodox Church as um, kind of uh, with hope for the things that weren't possible in the regard, with regard to reform um, or uh, some kind of progress in the Catholic Church in the context of uh, Western Ukraine, often appealing to kind of conflicts with uh, Polish Roman Catholics and then looking to uh, Moscow or the East as kind of a, uh, at least a temporary savior or replacement or uh, harbor. Um, and so there, I would say, there, not just Kostelnik, but other participants, if you look at the rhetoric of the speeches that were made in 1946 and in certain aspects of uh, what was being written and stated, uh, there was um, a naive openness. Uh, it should be noted that uh, all the members of the initiative group, whether it's Kostelnik or uh, who was uh, 
awarded with a mitre a few days already before the council uh, in, 19, in uh, March of 1946, or uh, Melnik and fathers Melnik and Pelvetsky, who were ordained bishops uh, in the Russian Orthodox Church um, after monastic tonsure two days before at the Cave Caves Lavra. Uh, they were all, they all died, uh, either assassinated or dying under mysterious circumstances uh, very soon after 1946. So uh, kind of seeing uh, the results of their actions and then uh, being able to hear from them uh, how they understood their decisions later on is not possible because of their uh, early and untimely death. Um, I think, though, that the person of Kostelnik, there hasn't really been uh, in-depth research on his writing or his person. There are some articles here and there. Uh, there's a scholar at Ukrainian Catholic University that worked on Kostelnik in the context of all these um, aspects going on in uh, the West that you mentioned, uh, Professor Yevseyeva, but as far as I know, there's no kind of dedicated monograph study. So this is actually one thing for the conference. We had invited somebody, but uh, they were unable to attend. So any doctoral students wanting to write a doctoral thesis on Havriel Kostelnik, um, it could be interesting, yeah. May, may I just add very briefly, maybe it's a point of interest for you, uh, something that probably people don't know. Uh, but I knew it from my experience of uh, serving the Ukrainian Orthodox Church some time ago. So there were uh, uh, initiatives circulating like 15 years ago or so, 20 years ago, coming from some bishops from the Western Ukraine, uh, bishops of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church under the Moscow Patriarchate, to canonize Father Gabriel Kostelnik. Uh, and uh, I should say that uh, those initiatives were quenched quietly from the church's leadership, and wisely, I believe. Mm. Uh, because the understanding was that let us not provoke further you know, quarrels and further divisions, uh, which was, I think, a very good token. Actually, it's a question, <laughs> because it, the, the, the venue of the conference uh, in 2016 was, I think, was chosen also because it was easier to have this kind of dialogue or study or reflection in a neutral context of Proriente in Vienna. But would it be now possible in Ukraine to have this kind of academic, co I, I'm not speaking about ecumenism or a dialogue, but just an academic conference on what happened in, in Viv uh, in March 1946 with scholars from different backgrounds and, and confessions. Yeah, uh, definitely the venue of Vienna was chosen uh, thanks to the important work of Pro Oriente um, Metropolitan Ilarion Othev was and perhaps still is a consultor of Pro Oriente. I'm not sure about the latest state of affairs. Um, and he had close collaboration and cooperation with Pro Orient. And I believe the organizers there sincerely believed, and I also believed that uh, at this kind of neutral location, Vienna is also very well uh, known to uh, Ukrainian Greek Catholics, uh, close history uh, from the past with the Habsburg Empire and also with work on the publications of Pro Orient on the Union of Brest, it was seen as a, a logical venue. And so it was uh, certainly disappointing that um, there wasn't this possibility, even though the conference was also kind of uh, by registration behind closed doors so people could speak uh, freely, and I think uh, they, they did. Um, with regard to the possibility of doing this in Ukraine now, in fact, there was a conference in March of 2016 in Kyiv at the um, National University of Taras Shevchenko, at least held in the halls there, organized by <laughs> scholars in Ukraine with international participation. Um, and I'm, I don't recall exactly if there was official uh, ecclesiastical representation from Orthodox churches, but there were Orthodox scholars, uh, even coming from the uh, Kiev Theological Academy of the Moscow Patriarchate at the time at the, at the Lavra, uh, to participate in the discussions. But uh, this was kind of on a smaller scale, and of course it didn't involve the churches, uh, 
present right now. In fact, as we speak, the uh, Ukrainian Council, all Ukrainian Council of Churches and Religious Organizations, is here in Rome. And um, I think it's today they are meeting the Pope. Today, yeah, or tomorrow. In any case, they're they're here in in uh, in in Rome, and one could even uh, hope for uh, discussions if not directly of uh, this question, which with a n kind of a new um, constellation of participants with the presence now of um, the representatives of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, um, some kind of vision to move forward. They have made various statements, not just during the war, but in past years uh, with a unified voice on questions that affect society um, and everyday uh, lives of the citizens of Ukraine as they refer to religious questions uh, with regard to internal ecumenical questions. This group also involves representatives that are uh, Jewish and Muslim, so perhaps questions of the Dviv Sobota, they might look at Christians quarreling about such questions and remind us uh, of Christ's command uh, or prayer that all may be one. Um, so, uh, But in Ukraine, as far as I understand, there's um, been no statements directly from any kind of uh, Orthodox Church uh, bodies uh, condemning this. There have been individual scholars here and there that oftentimes are active in the West. Uh, so, but yeah, the the your question about the challenge to kind of do this uh, scholarly uh, dialogue and and investigation in Ukraine is certainly a challenge. Well, if I may just add, uh, it's even more a challenge, surprisingly, that uh, it seems that the Ukrainian churches, uh, meaning two Orthodox churches and the Greek Catholic Church, cannot come together to discuss even such common body of texts as the, um, the, the collection of the uh, documents of the Orthodox Catholic dialogue. It was translated into Ukrainian, was presented uh, in the in the uh, in Sofia in Kiev, uh, I participated and participate in the presentation. It was before the war uh, escalated, and uh, I was surprised that the both Orthodox churches in Ukraine did not send their official representatives to that presentation. The Archbishop, the uh, Major Archbishop uh, Sviatoslav Shevchuk came. Uh, the work was done by the Greek Catholic Church, but this work was was related not just to the Greek Catholic Church, but it was primarily related to both the Catholic and the Orthodox Churches. And they decided not to come. Well, the individual scholars and, the, and theologians came, but not the church representatives. So unfortunately, the situation now is that the churches are not really talking much to each other. Maybe they talk, they will talk even, they will talk more when they come to, to Rome and see the Pope. <laughs> that would be a good opportunity for them to talk to each other. But we hope that eventually the churches will reconcile somehow and they, they eventually will, uh, will uh, be able to have such a discussion, on, including on uh, the, the Pseudo Council uh, in uh, 1946 and other, con and other issues that are pertinent to inter-church relations in Ukraine. Thank you, Father Cyril. Yeah, that uh, hope for a future dialogue, I think, is perhaps uh, the thought we should conclude with this evening. So I thank all of you for your attendance and your pa participation, and I pray that uh, not just for this week of Christian unity, but throughout the remainder of this year with prayers for the end to the war in Ukraine and to the Russian invasion, uh, beginning of peace, that we also are able to engage not just in monologues or uh, self-reflections, but also to find dialogue partners and discuss, and with this challenge of perhaps a new uh, approach to ecumenical dialogue that uh, arises from the difficulties, the sufferings, the pains, and the wounds of war. So thank you very much for your participation here, and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Father Thomas, thank you for joining us. And Father Yuri.